presenter is Professor Gloria Betcher. Uh, Dr. Betcher is a teaching professor in the Department of English here at Iowa State University. Uh, Ames City Council member, Dr. Betcher heads a team researching Black Iowa State College or ISC students to 1950 for the Tracing Race at ISU initiative. In 2022, her civic leadership and historical research resulted in the renaming of Ames Municipal Airport for ISC student and black flight pioneer, James Herman Banning. The title of Dr. Betcher's talk today is Beyond Carver and Trice, the importance of recognizing black students at Iowa State College. Thank you, Matt, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. Most people familiar with Iowa State will recognize the names George Washington Carver and Jack Trice as being some early black students here on campus, but it may be difficult to move beyond just naming those two students. And the purpose of this presentation is to move beyond Carver and Trice to look at the way in which recovering the history of other black students at Iowa State College can impact students today and also the larger world of public humanities. I am going to be using a script today because as Aaron Ridnars, often fond of reminding me, I can get down a rabbit hole pretty quickly and I'm gonna try and stay on time. I've even got my timer set. So the project that I'm gonna be talking to you about today is the Black ISC Student Experience to 1950, which is a part of the Tracing Race at ISU initiative. Tracing Race at ISU is a library-led initiative to encourage and support digital scholarship that centers the history and experience of BIPOC, Black, Indigenous, and people of color at Iowa State University and engages with the history of race, racism, and student faculty and staff activism. Tracing Race project proposals are reviewed twice a year by an advisory review committee and once in the spring, once in the fall, and if any of you are interested in proposing a tracing race project, you'll see Aaron's contact information at the end of this presentation. On the screen now, you'll see the address for our tracing race project. Research on the Black ISC student experience to 1950 began with two simple questions, where and who? Where did Black students up to 1940 find housing before they were able to live easily on campus? And who supported their efforts to find housing in Ames? You'll notice that the initial span of dates for this project was 1891 to 1940, because we knew that Iowa State started allowing black students to live on campus with white students sometime in the late 1940s. Residence Hall Director Shorty Schilleter recalled that it might have been 1947 when he first broke the unwritten rule that mixed black students with white students in on-campus housing, but we haven't been able to confirm that yet. Many folks from Ames will be aware of the local landmark Lincoln Way home of Archie and Nancy Martin, who housed black students and who have a residence hall on campus here named after them for their efforts on behalf of those students. But few know that ISU alumnus, who, Walter Madison, who is pictured in the center of this photo spread, also housed students in his home with his wife Gussie and their children at 1204 North 3rd Street in Ames. That's the color photo on the, I guess that's, well, to my left. Um, and you might not be aware that Archie and Nancy Martin's daughter, Nellie, and her husband, John Shipp, who lived at 118 Sherman, the house in the middle, also housed Black ISC students. There are, in fact, any number of people within the community who open their doors, their homes to those black students, and they needed to do that. Before 1940, 
Iowa State operated under an unwritten rule that black students would have to live with other black students if they wanted to live on campus, just like the Filipino students and other international students of color were expected to do with others of their race. That's what ISC President A.B. Storms informed civil rights activist and co-founder of the NAACP, W.E.B. Du Bois, in a letter dated June 17th, 1910. So you might notice that in this case, the black students were being treated just like the international students in their own country. Uh, and ISU administrators didn't really see anything wrong with that. This project is ongoing and it has a shifting research team with an ever expanding black student list. Right now, we're up to 114 students. That includes Jack Trice and George Washington Carver between 1891 and 1950. And I just added the most recent one yesterday. So we're continuing to find students. We're writing biographies for each of those students. And you can see above my head here what those biographies look like. We put in a photo of the student. We include information on the student's time at Iowa State College and any Ames residences that the student lived at. So far, we have found 48 residences that housed black students off campus. We are also in the process of writing sidelight stories on the black student experience. And we're hoping to get students and faculty interested in writing those stories to contribute to the project. That's ongoing. And we are continuing to partner with the Ames History Museum, the Ames branch of the NAACP, and community and regional planning classes, along with some honors students in the first year honors mentor program to create data for our project. This project brings together little known data and fills historical, sociological, and genealogical gaps. It can act as a resource to inspire students at HBCUs and at Iowa State because so many of the early black ISC students face tremendous financial and social hardship just to stay in school like many of our students today do. And yet many of those black students achieved national and international renown. The woman pictured here, Willie Lee Campbell Glass, along with being a, an MS honoree in home economics education in 1933, also received a Home Economics Alumni Centennial Award from Iowa State University and was inducted into the Texas Women's Hall of Fame in 1995. The project also acts as a family genealogical resource and families have been contacting us about students in the project who they recognize as their relatives. The site has also been used as an organizational history resource. The New York Botanic Gardens has been in touch to find out more about Iowa State College horticulturist Malcolm Stubblefield, who worked on several highly lauded WPA garden projects in the NYBG in the 1930s. A broader utility for the site has been as a race relations snapshot. Research has led us to understand more about racially restricted deed covenants in Ames, and I'm sure we'll hear more about those elsewhere in the state soon. And there is an image of one of those on this screen with the statement that this shall never be occupied by a Negro, nor for the purpose of doing a liquor business thereon. A broader utility also includes um, looking into segregated activities in Ames. For example, swimming in the local pool and athletic and judging competitions that restrict the participation of black students by so-called gentlemen's agreements, whereby non-segregated schools often capitulated to the requirements of segregated competitors. Also, because of this project, the Iowa African American Heritage Trail is seeking to add Ames locations to its tours and more homes have been identified that would be eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. Mapping the residents for this project illustrates community relationships among black students and with other Ames residents of all races. 
You can see here part of the story map that we constructed as an initial phase of our project and identifying those who are willing to rent to black students helps us understand not only the support networks that existed, but also how students might have interacted to feel more a part of this predominantly white community. So I'm just gonna go very quickly to look at a case in point. I'm conscious of my time here. Downtown on Main Street, 226 and a half Main, was an apartment called the Interstate Club, which housed future leaders. In this slide, when, um, Michael Cummings and uh, Landon Mule are also up here right now, they are not living there. Um, on this slide, we have not only Herman Banning, the first pilot, first black pilot to fly transcontinental, in the United States, but we also have Presidential Medal of Freedom awardee and Tuskegee University President Frederick Douglass Patterson and Alcorn State University President Jesse Otis. Along with these impressive men lived Kentucky State University President Rufus Atwood and a collection of agricultural and engineering professionals, many of whom were also fraternity brothers in the Alpha New chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha. At the same time, one of ISU's well-known figures, inspiring athlete Jack Trice, who was also a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha, and his wife Cora May lived in an apartment in the Masonic Building, no doubt accommodation furthered by Black ISC alumnus and well-respected HVAC professional Walter Madison, whose house we saw earlier. His shop was in the Masonic Building. These close ties built a community with a com within a community downtown in Ames. And we can see that the near residences of many other black residents of Ames formed an even broader community, allowing the residents to support each other in endeavors to stay employed, keep vehicles running to get to campus and find fellowship in the NAACP and local groups. We consulted a number of resources for this project. I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but I think the important thing to note is that we're consulting both primary and secondary resources to write those bios and sidelights that are aimed at the public. And we've had tremendous support from the Office of Digital Scholarship and Initiatives, including the help from Aaron, the Tracing Race at ISU coordinator who you heard this morning and her efforts to wrangle our students. We've had a number of student workers over the last four years, three years, and we've also had assistance from other library units, special collections and university archives, a veterinary medical library, digital press communications and research data services. So it's been a broad based effort. If you feel like getting involved with Tracing Race, you can contact Erin at this email address. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Our next presenter is Professor Alex Braidwood. Uh, professor Braidwood is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Education at the in the D Department of Graphic Design at Iowa State. And he's also the president of the World Listening Project. Uh, professor Braidwood is a sound artist, a media designer, an educator who maintains a practice exploring issues of sustainability at the intersection of arts and science. Uh, the title of Dr. Braidwood's talk today is Mechanisms for Actualizing Speculative Soundscapes, Making Nature Sound Accessible and Data Experiential Through Collective Listening Experiences. Thanks so much, and thanks for having me today. Um, so I'm going to walk through a few projects that I've created that get into this idea of bringing nature to people in different ways, but also surfacing data and making it something that people can access and, and can be, begin to sort of form some stories around. Um, if you're interested in the work that I'm doing, my Instagrams are up there, and my website is alexbraidwood.com. So I'm going to talk a bit first about sonification. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with this, the idea of sonification is the traditionally nonverbal audio representations and translation of data. We talk a lot about visualization, but sonification is the idea of taking that data and turning it into sound. And my work in this started 
when I became an artist in residence at Iowa Lakeside Lab. If you're not familiar with Iowa Lakeside Lab, it's up in Northwest Iowa. It's on West Okoboji Lake. It's a Regent Resource Center. It's a biological field research station. Uh, and we have an artist in residence program up there. Now I'm the director of that artist in residence program. Um, but the lab monitors a buoy that is in West Okoboji Lake. And actually now as of a couple of years ago, they have one in Spirit Lake as well. And the idea here is this buoy has an array of sensors between the water surface all the way down to the lake floor. Uh, and there's some sensors above the, the water surface as well. And so what I did was I developed a system that takes that data, uh, converts it into something that virtual instruments can understand, and then composes it into sound. So. We can nerd out about this part later if anybody's interested, but it's some code turned into some numbers, turned into some sounds, uh, and basically it sounds like this. So this is one very short sample. Uh, if you're interested, the this album that I created is available on Spotify, Tidal, and Apple Music. You can just search my name. And the idea here is I took a week of data and I turned it into an album where every day is a track. And so you can hear how different uh, events come in, different things change within the water. Uh, there's, a, there's a thunderstorm on Thursday and the amount of precipitation sounds pretty cool. Um, but the idea there is that it takes that data and it turns it into something that people can kind of like be with and be within. What's interesting about that lake data is you have all these different elements uh, and all these different um, sensors monitoring for things that are changing at very different scales. So when you start to apply that change to the way that music comes together, you get things that change quickly from moment to moment, from hour to hour, week to week, seasonally. And then now that I've been doing it for a few years, you hear these things that are different from, from one year to the next. I also had a chance to be an artist in residence at Isle Royal National Park. Uh, it's a big island in Lake Superior. Um, and the project that I created to donate back to the park as a result of that residence is called Listening Beyond the Edge. And what this did was this took the wolf moose research data that they've been collecting um, and turned it into a composition that also has a visual element. So the idea here is, you know, took a big ferry, went across the water, got to live in this cabin for a few weeks that was kind of out on this point, um, put together a little video about the commute just to kind of like see the environment. But the idea here is that through this sort of immersion in this really unique space, I had an opportunity to meet the researchers, Rolf Peterson and some of his uh, volunteers and some of the other researchers that were working on this uh, data collection to be able to learn more and more about what that program was and so I wanted to give back to the park something that they could use as almost like a storytelling element. So that piece uses field recordings as well as data that's turned into synthesis so that you can hear how the wolf moose population has changed and what their relationship was over the years that they've been monitoring. Part of that story is also when an ice bridge forms and when an ice bridge doesn't form. So that's another element that plays into the composition. I had an opportunity to develop a immersive installation at a gallery called Public Space One in Iowa City, um, and that is called the Cathedral to Aquatic Sonification. So this is created through a series of small performance machines that are in real time getting data from those buoys that are in West Okoboji Lake and turning them into synthesis and then having them installed in a dozen or so places around the gallery so that when you walk in, you are surrounded, you are immersed with the sounds that are being created by the data that's coming in real time from the lake. So here's a few photos of how these different elements are set up. So there's these small microcontrollers that are programmed to go to the Wi-Fi, they get the data in real time, they convert it into MIDI with some other control values, and then they perform the small synthesizers in the space. So when you walk in, you're really surrounded by what's happening with the water quality in that exact moment. So this ran over the course of a month, uh, and it was really interesting to see how the experience would change different times of day, and then even from the beginning to the end. And for this one, I wanted to give people insight into 
where the data was coming from and what it was representing. So I also created this mobile experience where by scanning the QR code, a visitor to the gallery could pull up this page that is in real time visualizing the sounds that are coming uh, from the data, but then they could also see what the data readings are. So if you followed from the entrance clockwise, this mobile experience would tell you what specific number was coming in from which specific sensor. So as they moved around, they could really get a sense for what it was they were, they were hearing. There was also a live performance uh, in the middle of this as part of the opening. So this is me uh, performing with some of the data and then also some field recordings that build up this larger performance that I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. And then the final iteration of this sort of performance machine sonification is a project that I created in collaboration with Dr. Diana Chester, who is a sound artist and researcher out of the University of Sydney. Uh, I've been working with this data set up at Iowa Lakeside Lab. She works with a data set that is monitoring Antarctic ice. And so we created this installation as part of the World Forum for Acoustic Ecology's uh, annual meeting, where in the space we had three performance machines that were oriented towards the Midwest and they were performing Lakeside Lab data three machines that were oriented towards the Antarctic and they were playing the ice monitoring data. This ran over the course of a full day during the festival or during the conference. Uh, and the programming was done such that every uh, value was pulled from the same time from each of the sensor monitoring stations. So you were hearing like, and in, in, taking into account the time difference as well. So you were hearing exactly, you know, what was happening in the liquid water and then what was happening on the, on the ice monitoring. And then in order to create sort of a focal point, since this was running all day, we also did a performance in the middle of this, uh, this space as well. So those performances are what I call mass or the mechanism for actualizing speculative soundscape. And the idea with this really started with how could I get people to care about nature sound? We've got endless streams of live, you know, audio feeds from forests. We've got CDs that you can buy from truck stops. We've got gadgets you can put next to your bed that play bird sounds all night. Like that's cool. But is there a way that I can create an experience that allows me to take advantage of all these really fortunate experiences that I've had where I've been able to go to these places, capture these things at really unique times of day in really pristine environments and bring them back to folks. And so I started thinking back to when I was an undergrad, uh, I was a drum and bass DJ, and I could get people to like pay attention and sort of like move together and be a part of the same experience. So I thought, what if I took like pop culture DJ equipment, but used it to play nature sounds? And so that's where this whole thing came together. I thought this is gonna be awesome, get people together, so just as a little like, you know, uh, foreshadowing, that was December, 2019. Uh, so a few months later, no gathering. So I did what everybody else did. I started streaming it. And the streaming actually then became the platform to experiment. It became my opportunity to commit to something. So for uh, almost 16 weeks straight, every Sunday, five o'clock, I started a live stream and I just started playing around, ended up getting together something that became like this performance uh, and I've been doing it quite a bit ever since. At first, some of them had themes. Then I just kind of started playing with this combination of like data, nature sound, composing things together. The arc for this performance from start to finish is modeled on this idea of a dawn chorus. So that's a little bit before sunrise when it's kind of like you're just hearing the bugs and the first few birds start to wake up, then everything gets really, really vocal, and then everything kind of settles into place. And, and dawn chorus is something that in the realm of acoustic ecology, you can look at and you can kind of assess how much human intervention there's been in a particular soundscape. So this is just a spectrogram of a dawn chorus that I recorded when I was an artist in residence in Australia. I also took some of those recordings. I put them on vinyl because if you notice, there was a turntable in the middle of that whole setup. So I've taken my recordings. Uh, I've, had them, I've had them run out on these 45s. Uh, and then that all becomes part of the show. The last thing that I want to tell you about this is there's also the visuals. And the visuals are being created in real time by processing the audio. So there's all these channels of audio being used to draw those graphics. Every 90 seconds, those graphics save as a high-res vector file. Uh, and then... I take those uh, and then I can use them for different things. Basically, it gives me like another visual record of any of those performances. So I had a chance to perform for a festival in Southern California. And as a thank you, I took all the graphics from that performance and put it into a book and sent it back to the people that organized the show. The last story that I wanna tell then is, oh, and this is an album that you can also find on Spotify, Tidal and Apple Music. It's called Serotonous Repose. Then the last story that I wanna tell is, 
that video, those videos of me performing with those graphics um, got a little bit of attention and it ended up uh, some people at an advertising agency saw it. And so they commissioned me to write audio visualization algorithms when Maestro relaunched their guitar pedals. So I created an algorithm based on the characteristic of each of these guitar pedals. Um, if you've seen guitar pedals before, the first one ever was this fuzz tone, the original fuzz tone. Maestro basically invented the idea of guitar pedal. So when they were re releasing them, uh, they wanted to really lean into this idea of shape your sound. So I wrote these algorithms that created these visualizations, and then that became all of the promotional elements. And that's my time. Thank you very much. Our next presentation has two presenters, so I'm going to be introducing two people. It, so if, if I sound confusing, I don't mean to. Um, one of the presenters is Professor Gordon, uh, Colin Gordon. Uh, professor Gordon is a professor in the Department of History at University of Iowa and is an author of several books, most recently, Patchwork Apartheid, Private Restrictions, Racial Segregation, and Urban Inequality. His digital projects include Growing Apart, a political history of American inequality, dividing the city, race restrictive covenants in St. Louis and St. Louis County, Citizen Brown, and Mapping Segregation in Iowa. Our additional presenter is Dr. Ashley Howard. Dr. Howard's an assistant professor of history and African American studies at the University of Iowa. Dr. Howard's first book, Midwest Unrest is under contract with the UNC Press. Her work has appeared in numerous other scholarly and media outlets. In 2021, she was recognized for her public-facing scholarship in the wake of the 2020 George Floyd uprisings with the University-wide Faculty Communicating Ideas Award. In 2023, Howard and Gordon were awarded a Mellon Foundation grant to examine race-based property restrictions in Iowa. The title of their talk is Iowa's Covenants Project, Preliminary Findings on Race Restrictions in Lynn and Polk Counties. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research project and then pass it on to Ashley, and she's going to talk about the sort of student engagement uh, in the research. So um, we're researching uh, race restrictions in eight uh, metropolitan counties in Iowa, uh, following on work that I've done in St. Louis and uh, Minneapolis and other, and other settings. And these are uh, uh, private uh, covenants on property. Um, they're buried in the records of county recorder's office. And there's sort of an amalgam of sort of a mashup of what you would currently find in building codes, zoning ordinances, and HOAs. Um, and the example you gave is a good one, often positioning African-American occupancy as a nuisance alongside, you know, glue factories and, and uh, the, the sale of liquor. So we're doing eight metropolitan counties. This is in collaboration with our uh, digital studios, helping us with the, the uh, web development and other elements and, and some of the mapping. Um, it's an interesting project to involve students in uh, because it's very much sort of mixed methods because there's 3,100 counties in the United States and everyone keeps their records a little bit differently. Uh, some are digitized. And so as you'll see for Lynn County, we're um, able to use fully digitized records um, that we then sort of run OCR on and have to do a distant reading of. Uh, in some settings, we use the, the county's own index where they say, well, here's what the restrictions are. And we can go into the deed books. And in some settings, it's more sort of a wild west. And you have to sample the deed books, get a sense of what's going on. Um, and for smaller counties, you just sort of have to go page by page through the deed books. Uh, so, you know, Lynn County, for example, uh, is about a quarter of a million pages of um, uh, records uh, St. Louis, which I've done, is about 6 million pages for the period, for the first 50 years of the 20th century. Uh, so these are the eight uh, metro counties that we're doing. Uh, Blackhawk uh, and uh, Johnson County were done by student projects for the last couple of years. We're currently engaged in research on Lynn and Polk. And I just want to give you a sense of uh, what some of that looks like. Um, so... If we go to Waterloo, for example, we, we can go to the map and we have, uh, can you hold this for a moment? Um, 
And so a slider on the map and you can see the restrictions over time um, coded by the kind of restriction we can talk about later. And then if you go into any one of these, you can actually pull up uh, the, the document itself. And here, thanks. Uh, and so, as I said, we've done uh, Blackhawk and um, uh, Johnson counties. Uh, we're in the process of doing uh, Lynn County and Cedar Rapids. And so this is our uh, work in progress on uh, on Lynn County, showing the extent of restriction. And this is our work in progress on Des Moines, uh, showing a, a sampling of the restrictions we found uh, so far. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Ashley. Hello, everybody. Thanks again for having us. Uh, so we've been having a great time uh, this semester, and how many people get to say that? Uh, but this, it was a Mellon Higher Learning Grant. So one of its major objectives that it wants to fund is student learning. Um, and so in our conversations, Kyle and I were really thinking about what is it um, that we want students to learn and how are they going to move through this. Um, so this is the work, right? This is the actual research. And you see the the nice visual, we basically replicated deed books. These are again from Lynn County. They went and they digitized everything and through an agreement um, with the University of Iowa, they just gave it to us all in their replicated form. So we can throw it up on the OneDrive, students sit in class, they, you know, do a, a control F through the OCR and they find, you know, a number of keyword searches and then they enter it in into a shared Excel spreadsheet. And um, that's really exciting. What's less exciting is what you see on the other hand. Uh, this is what the records look like in Poke. So really you have to take them off the shelves and go page by page by page. There was a flood in 1990. Three, thank you. In 1993, I want to say it was before my time, but that's not true. Um, we can pretend, though. Um, and so some of them have water damage and mold. So in addition to going page by page with your pencil, documenting these things, you also use a letter opener and, you know, gloves, preferably a mask, maybe a hazmat suit. Um, so we are actually going to have... Um, a group of students and our graduate assistant working in the Polk County um, County Registrars uh, for two weeks after the semester and really getting into um, some of these things. So this work has been incredibly exciting um, because students have the, the thrill of the archive. And I, and I think like, you know, DJs versus the thrill of the archive, totally different things that make us both cool. Um, but, you know, to each their own. Um, and in some ways, it's kind of exciting because students are working collaboratively. We're using a tile classroom, which my colleague talked about earlier, that has screens all around and students are sitting together at circle, circular tables like you all are. And so they can go back and forth with their restrictions. They can talk to other tables. Oftentimes it has kind of an odd bingo feel that students are like, yes, I found one. And then like, oh, I found one, right? Like that's not something to be excited about because we're finding these racial restrictions, but it still has this, you know, excitement that they can see in real time the work that they're doing. Um, and then there's also a little bit of, you know, social history that's by just on class on Tuesday, yesterday, um, students, we'll call her Eunice G because you never know who's in these rooms. I mean, she died in Oakland in Alameda County in 1970. So I doubt she's here. And if she is, I hope you also have some sort of, you know, poltergeist degree here at the university. Um, but her name just kept coming up, kept coming up, kept coming up. And so one of the tables is like, who is Eunice G? We got to find her. And so they're dipping into Ancestry.com. They're looking at the digitized manuscript records. And so we are seeing students in real time using these kind of skills um, that we taught them. So to that end, this is kind of how we built out the class. We wanted to think about the social, cultural, political, and economic impact of the great migrations and the responses to the great migrations. So because Colin and I are team teaching this course this semester, I often like to joke um, that, you know, well, this is true. 
that science uh, that Colin is a social scientist trained as a social scientist. I am trained as a social historian. So in my mind, we are competing for the hearts and minds of the future history. And, and so, you know, Colin will throw up some cool data and he's like, look at this. Isn't it amazing? And I was like, but let me tell you the story of this person. And so we, we have this punch and Judy thing kind of going back and forth of who's going to win. It's going to be me. Um, and so the way that we form this is really thinking large and then drilling down. So beginning to think about the nation and really unpacking these push and pull factors and not showing that the Great Migration was a foregone conclusion. To think about the ways in which African-Americans were organizing and asserting agency in under Jim Crow conditions and under you know penalty of death in some places. And then we kind of narrowed it down to think about what the North meant as a region and focusing on the underlying italicized black metropolis of Chicago and what it meant to go to the promised land. Um, and then from there, we talked a bit about region and how regions are conceptualized and then landed in Iowa. And because of that kind of broad framing, we have also been able to introduce students to different types of ways of seeing the Midwest and to seeing the Black experience, Black Iowa experience, in ways that they may not have. Um, so we've done some um, sonic experiences, listening to Nina Simone's Old Jim Crow's Gotta Go, Amanda Gorman's um, poem about that and thinking about how Black people are thinking, Black artists are thinking about this. What you see here is a group of students in the Iowa Women's Archive at the university. Um, and we separated this class, which is about 25 students. Half went to the State Historical Society in Iowa City, half went to the Iowa Women's Archive, and they got in there. And they were looking at representations of Black life, like my colleague was saying here, that goes beyond this kind of doom and gloom narrative, right? And thinking about the structures that Black people are making in these communities, how they're supporting one of those, and what life looks like outside of the white gaze. Um, we've also done some art, either through poetry or through the Lawrence J Jacob Lawrence migration series. Um, and then again, balancing that with census data, looking at maps and seeing where people are leaving to come to Iowa. Where are these kind of concentrations of people coming from and thinking about how that aligns with some of these community and social aspects of it. Um, the other thing that I felt um, was particularly resonant for me this morning is that digital humanities are just now humanities. And we can see this you know, very clearly in the types of exercises that we can do in this classroom. So this is, this is our classroom. Um, that they would not have been able to do even, you know, 10 years ago. Um, so one of the, I think, best assignments that we've come up with, you know, in class, hands-on, is having students figure out if they were leaving from someplace, how they would navigate as a Black family from getting to, from a Southern destination to a northern destination. And so you can see in the background of that whiteboard, this is one um, class's route from New Orleans up to Chicago, right? So this kind of Illinois Central Railroad connection that so many African-Americans took to the Midwest. Um, we also had a uh, table figure out what it was like getting from Washington, D.C. to Iowa City, which was actually a, um, a not a voyage, but a trip um, that one University of Iowa female student in 1917 made. And so really thinking about how it was done. In order to do that, they had 1930s historical roadmaps, which have been digitized. They had the green books, which have, uh, these are the traveler guides by William Green that were digitized. And they had plain old fashioned Google maps, right? Which they could pull up and kind of map the 1930s version with the highway version. And, you know, this kind of talk about born digital versus, you know, digital you know, immigrants um, or born into digital is so interesting because students are thinking about the skills that they already possess versus the ways in which we have to think historically. And that we may not just have the, the answers at our fingertips, 
because we're not thinking like someone from 1920, um, from 1930. And then they're able to use those maps once again, or those mapping skills once again, when they're doing the work of the racial covenants, they're able to look at a plat map and identify where it is. They're able to look at the county recorders and look at the various designations and lots and figure out where they are. And Colin, because we, you know, sometimes we just have to do what we have to do, printed off several sheets. What was it, 20 for the Cedar Rapids? Eight by 11s and made a giant poster for them to go up and actually figure out where they would mark the various subdivisions that had restrictions and highlight it. And again, that was marrying what they saw in the historical documents, what they saw at the, recounter, the county recorder's office, and what they were able to figure out looking at streets and other types of landmarks that are on the Google Maps. Um, and so in thinking of what this means for future, gen future generations, perhaps, and future directions is engaging students who are from the towns that we are researching. This has been actually, I think, a really great experience that students can say, oh, I know that place. I always thought they were a little sketchy, right? And so they, they're putting in their own lived experiences into these stories. Um, one of the names that continue to come up in these covenants is Nathan P. Dodge. And one of our students from the Omaha area is like, wait, Nathan P. Dodge, like NP Dodge Real Estate? I was like, precisely, right? And so they're making these connections that maybe there's not a direct through line, but the history certainly has an impact on the present. So in addition to continuing to integrate students into these research projects in their hometowns, um, thinking about these sidelight stories, which I just love that as a phrase, uh, how can we break out beyond these just kind of narratives of repression to think of how things are being built. And also the concept as our, title, our course is titled of great migrations, plural. And so yes, the first wave and the second wave, which has been rather well documented, but also thinking of intra-regional migrations. So are black people moving from large metro areas like Chicago, Detroit, into smaller communities? Are they moving between large metropolitan areas? And that's some of the things that students can begin to unpack by this combination of looking at restrictive covenants, looking at manual census records, and piecing together their own and others' family stories. So with that, that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professors Howard and Gordon. Our final presenter today is Olivia Weichel. Weichel, am I saying that right? Weichel. I've been saying it wrong at times, so I must admit. But, uh, which is really ridiculous because we've been working together for so long now on this. It's just Olivia to me. Uh, and Olivia is head of digital scholarship and initiatives here at Iowa State University. Uh, Olivia supports a team focused on digital collections, the digital repository, and digital scholarship, and is passionate about fostering collaboration to strengthen digital initiatives within the library and beyond. She's a co-developer of the Collection Builder Static Web Framework, and her research interests include sustainability in digital libraries and digital literacy instruction. The title of her talk today is Creating Community in Digital Scholarship, Leveraging Collection Builder for Multilingual Collaboration. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, so digital scholarship historically has really had a tendency to prioritize English language projects and tools that focus on English language material, which excludes, um, you know, valuable contributions and perspectives from the non-English speaking communities. Um, and this has been recognized by the larger digital humanities or DH community um, in, in several ways, but um, most recently there's an uh, um, a chapter in the debates in the digital humanities, the latest edition of that book by uh, Quinn Dombrowski and Patrick J. Burns, um, imploring us to challenge the role of English as the default setting in DH research. And I'm um, arguing today that that can be extended beyond um, just DH research to the public um, work that we do in, in digital humanities and digital scholarship. 
So a few ways that the privilege of the English language exists is in, um, just to name a few here, optical character recognition and natural language processing technologies and tools um, have been refined and trained primarily on English language material. Um, tutorials for using computational methods to process text and images. Um, are, those tutorials are primarily written in English, and I'm thinking specifically of tutorials that are um, for folks from humanities and arts coming to these um, to these tools for the first time and wanting to engage with them. Um, and lastly, web platforms for publishing cultural heritage materials um, really can be difficult to customize and manage and um, communicate non-English language content. So these last two, especially um, tutorials and web platforms, um, have these implications beyond DH research on the ability of communities and, um, and individuals to publish cultural heritage materials um, in, in languages other than um, English, and that's um, extending, I think, to the public realm. So there are communities in digital humanities that are doing um, work to alleviate this today. Um, Global DH is a, a, a yearly conference that happens at Michigan State University that brings together presenters um, from a diverse array of backgrounds in, in many different languages and translates those presentations into different languages. So um, thereby allowing a, a greater diversity of perspective at that conference. Um, and programming historian um, is uh, another pretty popular website in digital humanities that invites um, uh, people from, uh, again, humanities backgrounds to walk, walk through really um, thorough tutorials to learn um, a wide array of digital skills from text analysis to web building. And um, though they were started primarily in English, they now have um, a, a wide array of tutorials in uh, Spanish and Portuguese and French as well and are, are growing um, pretty quickly in those languages too. So I'm particularly interested in how we can make it easier to publish um, digital collection and digital scholarship, digital exhibit projects in languages other than English. Um, th this is where my, my research lies. Um, and for those who don't know, Digital collections can um, is typically defined as digitized or born digital cultural heritage material. Um, and I, at Iowa State, uh, our digital collections are, are often digitized archival material. So I put up a link to our digital collections if you're interested in kind of exploring um, what we mean by that. Um, and I'm a co-developer of a digital collection exhibit platform called Collection Builder. Um, which is an open source static web um, framework for building digital collections and exhibits. And I have the project site as well as some examples um, or a link that goes to many examples. Um, so you can see what, what that uh, looks like. And um, though none of us who are developers of Collection Builder actually speak anything other than English, um, that we've had this interesting experience where the public outreach, the tutorials, and the community building that we've done around the tool have um, really led to some exciting opportunities and solutions for publishing um, digital projects in languages other than English um, in really sustainable ways. So that's what I'm going to um, focus on today. So Collection Builder um, is metadata driven. So it, it takes a, a spreadsheet of metadata um, in a folder of you know, well-formed JPEG, uh, PDF, audio and, and video files um, and outputs uh, a really sustainable digital collection website um, that can be hosted uh, in a really simple web server or most often for free um, using GitHub pages. Beyond the sort of typical um, things that you'd expect from a digital collection website. So a browse page, an, an item page where you can view the item up close and then view its metadata. Um, collection Builder also offers um, to, it also automatically outputs a number of visualizations. So if you have metadata for you know latitude and longitude, Collection Builder will automatically output a, a map visualization. If you have tagged your items in your collection with subjects, it will output a word cloud where you can kind of visualize the um, which subjects are uh, more heavily weighted in the collection, um, and it'll automatically output a timeline if you have dates in your metadata. So there are many advantages of Collection Builder, which I won't get into today, but um, for the case of what we're talking about here, I think one, some of the most important are the fact that it's low cost, so um, you can host it for free. And it builds out the website's pages in such a way that um, it uh, will last for a long time. So it won't be a, a website and a platform that you have to maintain and spend a lot of money on and manage um, for you know the, the next 
five years of your life, if it if it um, even lasts that long, it um, will actually stay working for um, you know ten years uh, without you having to do anything to it. It might look outdated, but it'll continue to work, um, and it, you can host it for free. Um, and the other part of this is that it's um, easily customizable. So the code is um, is open, and you can get in and kind of learn from it and um, and uh, change it to fit whatever your need is. And the big point around that is uh, to allow for that customization is um, that my team and I have put um, a ton of energy and uh, effort into creating a lot of documentation around Collection Builder so that you don't have to be a web developer to spin up a site. You don't have to know anything. You just have to follow the directions. You don't have to follow, you don't have to um, download any software. You can get a site up and running in about uh, 30 minutes if you have your metadata ready to go. Um, and then from there, you can kind of uh, build out and uh, customize to fit whatever your, your use case is if you want to. So within that um, documentation, uh, through conversations with folks who are starting to customize it, um, we quickly learned that people um, were using this kind of all over the world and uh, were wanting to customize the site's default language. So um, there are a number of things that we hand coded into the site at the beginning that were um, that are you know just in English, and they're wanting to know how to find those things in the code and edit them to uh, fit whatever language they're publishing in. So um, because of those sort of communi initial community building uh, efforts, so the documentation, the workshops that we've done, um, without our even talking to them, uh, folks uh, have have created non-English sites um, in a number of languages. So I put up a couple here in. Um, uh, Italian and Spanish, and then another person uh, created a um, a programming historian tutorial for Collection Builder in Spanish. Without again, without you know communicating with us, which is which is good, which is what we want. So um, taking what they learned and then translating it into something that they think uh, others can follow. Um, and we've also had official partners, which has led to the work that I'll finish up with. Um, so at the University of Houston, Arte Publico Press is um, one of the oldest uh, um, publishers of, of U.S. Hispanic authors in the U.S. Um, and then the University of Basel in uh, Switzerland has um, the, their Center for Digital and Data-Driven History and Storytelling. So um, folks from both of these uh, centers and organizations have been working with us. And that works sort of um, taking place in two arenas right now. So um, we're adjusting uh, Collection Builder so that it eventually the user can just choose a language to build the site out in without having to go in and um, you know edit the code in a million different places. Um, and if they don't see an option to build it out in the um, in the language that they're choosing, they can uh, they'll be able to you know, write out their own language, uh, it kind of translate it themselves and then add that code to the community so that others can build out the site in that new language. Um, that's happening with the University of Basel um, collaborators and with the University of Houston collaborators, we're working on uh, Collection Builder Multilingual, which will allow the users to toggle back and forth between languages. So I see this being really useful for um, communities that uh, are bilingual or maybe multilingual to be able to publish um, cultural heritage materials that are of uh, you know historical significance and can be viewed in whatever language the user is most comfortable in. So none of again none of us original developers, um, me included, is bilingual. Um, so this, by definition, has to be a collaborative effort with these partners and with the feedback from the greater community. Um, and I think that there are a lot of implications for this, how this work sort of is sort of happening and ref reflected in the future. So um, it enables, hopefully enables individuals and community organizations, um, historical societies, public historians, uh, genealogical researchers, just family researchers to have access to um, quickly transform their material into a language that is most meaningful and communicative for them um, and can extend and then customize that site uh, in, in a way that's meaningful too and hopefully it will last um, you know, for a long time in, uh, and uh, be up for others to, to, to use and, and gain meaning from. For the, in the future. 
Um, so I think this is just one more step towards that more diverse representation of cultural heritage materials on the web, building out uh, digital humanities to be a more sort of inclusive and diverse um, place. So thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Please join me in a round of applause for all of our presenters today. We're going to open the floor to general questions and Michael's going to come around with a microphone if you have a question. Uh, thank you all so much. These are great projects, um, super inspirational. Olivia, a question for you about cultural heritage management. I, I work in Jordan mostly, and I'm curious about how this, in your experience, works when you get out of kind of the Latin alphabet. Um, so uh, it has, it should work in any sort of alphabet that you can type in, um, as long as it has UTF-8 encoding capabilities. So um, I think the most uh, maybe diverse case has been uh, a, a site created in Russian. Um, I don't know if we've had any uh, from in Arabic. Yeah. Oh, actually, no, there have been a couple in Arabic. Um, I can find a couple examples and send you. Um, so it should work with, um, as long as, you know, you're using the right encoding for, for the web, um, you, both in your metadata and in the site's language, um, it would work for that. Thanks. Thank you all. This was inspiring yes. to mimic uh, Bjorn. Um, being that uh, the projects that you presented here are all public facing, um, I'm curious what potentials you all see for those projects to be taken up for any like public activistic um, work, or have you have you seen that within the communities that you're engaging with? Uh, so the the first iteration of work that I did this with I did actually did with equal housing groups in St. Louis, and so the map was hosted by um, the Greater St. Louis Equal Housing Opportunity Council, and it was used as a mechanism for people to redact the, to find restrictive covenants and have them formally uh, redacted. Um, so we were very conscious of, of of doing that sort of public uh, face that that's one of the benefits of doing the public facing work. Um, in some respects, the the sort of gold standard for this that that um, we've been building on is the project that came out of Minneapolis called Mapping Prejudice, which um, actually used crowdsourcing to involve the public in in um, going through the records. Um, Hennepin County was an unusual case because they had digitized records going back to 1914, so they could um, they could host them in that way. And we initially thought we would we would be able to do something like that, um, working with our colleagues in in, uh, in Minneapolis, but for the moment, it's just it's sort of the student engagement and the public facing from part of it. So, Hannah, I didn't quite hear the middle of your question, um, but I I'm thinking that it was groups taking this up from where we have left off. Is that? sort of, or how things can be used. Um, one of the things that that is emerging from our project is that the local branch of the NAACP has become very interested in what we're finding. Um, the NAACP has a, a rather um, difficult past here in Ames. The, 
we're a predominantly white community, and there was a, a chapter of the NAACP that was active in the 1920s and 30s, but there just were not enough African Americans in Ames consistently after like 1938 because of the the people moving because of the Great Depression and and relocating elsewhere, and so the NAACP Ames branch was reestablished in, I think, 1993. And so I've been working with the, the local branch, trying to reclaim some of their history and also trying to use the project as a means of encouraging students here at Iowa State to reinvigorate the branch on campus, which was always a, a very active branch back in the 20s and 30s, but again, um, not so much anymore. And so that that tie to an organization that is seeking ways to inspire continuing involvement is something that I think can come out of this. I've also talked to a number of, of people associated with the HBCUs where our students went and I, it made my day to talk to a colleague from Kentucky State uh, when I said, so Rufus Atwood was at Kentucky State. And she said, you know Rufus Atwood? We have a Rufus Atwood Hall and we have Rufus Atwood Day and we have his oral history collection. And she was just so excited that there was a tie that her students could be exploring to tie into their own history. And I think many of us know that HBCUs are chronically underfunded. They don't typically have a lot of money for doing special collections work and they're dependent on partners. And I would love to see our Tracing Race project be used buy students from HBCUs, get them to contribute their side of the story for those students who came up from the South to Iowa State and to explain things like that Jim Crow South to Iowa North transition and look at the routes of travel, the challenges that were faced, and all of those things that, that you're doing wonderfully in your project. Yeah, not exactly activism, but because it's about water quality, that's that's not an uncontentious topic in Iowa. Um, and so like when I first did, when I did the very first project of turning the, the buoy data into music, I, I was featured on Iowa Public Radio and it offered a really great opportunity to talk about, and the lab continues to go back to this, about why it's valuable to monitor the water quality. It's not just about, oh, egg is doing this, egg is doing that. It really is about keeping tabs on and trying to understand why water systems work the way that they do, uh, especially with like bodies of fresh water and, and how, you know, sort of elements are linked together and things like that. So over the years, it's been a really great discussion point uh, for the value of having this sort of ongoing ecological monitoring network. Just as an addendum to Colin's point, um, there is an activist group in Minneapolis by the name of Free the Deeds, and they've been doing some really cool public-facing work as well. Um, I, for one, am very inspired by when folks take history and this stuff and make art into it. And this was one of the initiatives that Free the Deeds did, so they would have signs in yards that said this house has a re racial restriction on it um which you know is very public facing um but they also took um photographs turned those into paintings and wrote narratives about the people who crossed these color lines um and and i think that's a really interesting way to get at people in a history you know again we are being constantly inundated, particularly in this state, with questions about, you know, CRT and history that makes people feel bad and yada, yada, yada. Um, and I think this is a way to get at these ways in a way that is inviting conversation and interpretation that is very deeply rooted in a historical experience. Um, so while there is 
nothing on our kind of front that is addressing that piece of it. I think that's such a ripe opportunity for collaboration between the arts and the humanities. So I would love to see more of those types of things. Um, I don't have too much to add, but I, I'd say that, you know, as you all are talking, my mind is going to, um, you know, communication and sustainability of these issues. And so um, along those lines, I think, uh, in terms of activism, uh, collection builder, uh, because of this emphasis on documentation around it and community building around it, I think could go on to have a life of its own and and hopefully, you know, used in all of these um, in, in many different scenarios. Uh, so it, it theoretically could be an activist, um, you know, movement too um, that uses it for because it's there, it's readily available and, and it's, you know, it's free, it's, it's accessible. So um, making it a tool that um, that as many different as many people can can access for as many diverse use cases as possible, um, I think could lead to situations like that in the future. I'm going to call on myself. So I'm not a digital humanist in the way that I want to be. And I was wondering what advice those of you at the table or those of us in the room here who are or who are digital scholars in some other way, what, where do you start if you're somebody who's sort of been in the game for a little while and would love to do more and can see the impact, the positive impact this has, where's a good place to start? at projects that are out there. There are so many different types of projects that you can find your bliss <laughs> in those projects. And once you start seeing the multiplicity of the projects, then you can start thinking about what you would like to investigate and how that fits into some of those other um, available platforms, like Aaron talked about this morning, the the challenges of um, making her students think through what do I want to do and how do I want to do that? And I, like any good research project, I think you have to decide what it is you want to do. And by looking at what others have done, you can get some inspiration. And it's fun, too. I want to sneak in while you try to figure out how to turn that on. Um, but as somebody in the crowd, since you, you said that, uh, the public digital libraries and librarians, I went to Nikki years ago and I said, I want to do an online exhibition, but I don't know how, what do I do? And Nikki said, oh, try this software. So you've got the resource right here, probably. Am I, am I selling that well enough? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I would add. I think I think there tends to be a little bit of slippage between digital humanities and public humanities and public digital humanities. So I, I mean, for myself, I I sort of lean on the older definition, which is digital humanities using computational methods to do humanistic research, and it doesn't. There's nothing necessarily public facing about it. Um, that's a, in some respects, it's a different skill set and a different um, different aspiration. But I think I mean one thing that it does point to. Um, is the importance of collaboration. I mean, it's disastrous to train, you know, historians to design web pages and and learn how to do the maps. And it's like, you know, because they make lousy maps and and ugly web pages for the most part. Um, but we're also like, we're you know, we're not um, socialized in a collaborative uh, uh, profession. So, I mean, the work that I do with um, my colleagues in the digital studio, with my colleagues in the social sciences is absolutely sort of integral to be able to doing this work that, um, I, you know, I think it's a mistake to think that, oh, you know, I have to have an interactive map to go with my book and, and then, you know, sort of knock your head against the wall trying to figure out how to do that. I think that um, uh, idea of collaboration is is really important to doing um, digital humanities and public 
digital humanities too. Um, and is something that is you maybe a little bit, maybe not so much anymore, but still a little bit unique to uh, humanities, you know, tr traditional humanities fields that um, traditionally are a little bit more like you, you do your research and you don't um, have as many opportunities to collaborate. So um, finding others who uh, you can talk to and learn from um, working with a team, uh, I think it just makes it a little more fun too. Um, so that's another benefit of, of digital humanities. Uh, but I think, um, the, another important aspect I would say to somebody who's new to it is just learning to to make mistakes and be okay with them and learn from them. I think you can't really engage with any of the work that's happening here and, you know, any map building, any, um, you know, any other of the descriptions of the research that are being described up here without um, having gone through, um, you know, lear the learning process. And uh, it's not something that maybe we all feel comfortable with at first and maybe we feel like imposters at first because we're not doing it as expertly as somebody who has been doing it for five years but um that person who has done it for five years went through the same learning process as you so um being comfortable with messing up and then learning how to fix it i think is a big step um, in that direction I was just going to chime in on the, the some thoughts from the, the crowd as well. Um, with that is, is collaboration, obviously, is one of those things that it's, it's came up. But I th and along with that, some of what um, Olivia had talked about as well, the sustainability of those projects, right? Is like, what are you wanting that project to be? Or, or how far in advance are you wanting that project to be, live on? And that's one of those things. It's like, there's, depending on the system, there's migration issues and who's going to manage that? Are you going to continue managing that? Are you expecting another entity to manage that? Um, that needs to be thought of. I know um, from a previous ex university, I worked at Texas A&M and the special collection is there. Uh, one of the faculty members um, in Spanish, I, I can't, I think um, we, they had collected probably the largest collection of Don Quixote in the United States is at Texas A&M, the special collections there. His project looked specifically at the iconography in Don Quixote, but how they had built the project, the sustainability of that project was how are we going to be able to continue? Cause he wanted the project to continue living on after he retired. And it's like, well, who's managing this? Um, so it's one of those things of, it was an important project, but how can we make it work that is if you want that legacy to live on right down the road that it's 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 one of those things that working with folks who um again that collaborative part of how can we do that because always soft, software migration software migration because nothing lives on forever in a certain platform more more words from the crowd um Upvotes to everything that's already been said. Additionally, I would say advice that I commonly give on a first consult um, for a digital project is to think aspirationally for sure. Like I think there are often like great grand ideas of like these are all the things that we'll do and it'll have all these features and it'll do all these things. But to start very con small and concrete and to to have a very clear idea of this is the this is the core of this project. This is the heart of this project that we're going to build on. And let's get it right because often you're needing to create or mobilize a lot of labor, infrastructure, workflows. Um, if there's not already kind of an existing model, especially like even just within your institution that you're able to kind of utilize. Um, and that to to put together something that is sustainable that is going to reach the audience you want to reach and um be something that can activate them in a, in a like a functional way i think it's better to start with some like a very narrow scope or a very defined scope that you can then build on or scale up rather than starting with we're going to map every neighborhood in the United States for restrictive covenants. Well, no, you you pick a an area that's local and you build you kind of build out a workflow and then you scale it up from there and find additional partners and can find extra funding and and that sort of thing. So starting small is a good thing <laughs> that you can always build up from. I mean, I I was going to make sort of the same point because the work we've done with the digital studio 
in a sense, has solved one of the problems we talked about this morning, which is what do you do with this, this the work that students do during the semester? But if you have a sustainable, well-supported, library-based website, the students can plug themselves in in small ways and just sort of build that. And, you know, and one nice thing about, you know, doing restrictive covenant works at the county level is it's infinitely scalable, right? Well, I mean, to 3,141 counties anyway. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's extremely important. And, and you know, in terms of the of the collaboration, of, I mean, for a while, I, I kept a running list of DH projects that said at the bottom, best viewed with Netscape Navigator. Um, because, because that's what you get when you leave it to individual faculty to, you know, go ahead and, and do it. I, following on this, um, I would perhaps add a, uh, an object lesson from our experience, um, working through the black student project that was originally the black student housing experience. It was a story maps project and we had so much data. We crashed story maps repeatedly. Um, and we had to find another platform that would allow us to do what we wanted to do. We kept the story map. And so that's now linked into our, um, our website, but we, we spent time talking about, do we do a Mecca? Do we do, um, oh, I don't even remember all of them. We went through so many of them. We ended up with a WordPress site simply because, you know, it it's supported by Iowa State. It's pretty easy to work with. Students could work with it. And I'm familiar with it. It's not my favorite, but, you know, it did what it needed to do. And so I'm curious what the, the Deeds Project is working with for your platform. Um, so I was sort of struck listening to all of you about um, sort of subjectivity and data. And I think with Alex, with you, you know, talking about, especially with the buoy project, it sounds like you um, had, uh, you know, a lot of data and then you had to make decisions around how that was going to be um, interpreted and, and, or um, uh, communicated to people. And so I think um, one question I have, and I, I, I think that's obviously part of art, but I'm curious about sort of your decision process um, for deciding how, how to like interpret that data and then put it out there in the world for others? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, and it started with so in this in the realm of sonification, uh, if I just like really simplify it, the idea of turning data into sound, it's like oh, if the number is fifty five, you hit the fifty fifth you know key on the piano, right? Higher number, higher note, lower number, lower note. And so a lot of sonification work ends up very kind of like plonky, like note, 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 drum, 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 that kind of thing. And so I really set out to make something that I thought was beautiful. I wanted something that people wanted to spend time in and with, um, especially because it's it, it's water quality and, and that is water. It's our second most important thing that keeps us alive, right? Like we're really drawn to it. Um, and so I wanted that for the space. I didn't want it to be too eerie. I didn't want it to be weird. I didn't want it to be, uh, you know, too dissonant. And so when I built that system, I tried to craft it so that it would be that, that it would be a, an experience that people wanted to, to stay within. But the other thing that was important to me, because so a part of my background is as a graphic designer, I wanted to ensure that it was accurate to the data within my system. So with those tracks, like with the tracks from the, you know, West Okaboji buoy from 2018, 2019, last year, this coming summer, when you run the data set through the system, you get the same results, even though it sounds big and ambient and flowy, same data, same result. And that was really important to me. I got asked to come to a conference one time about um, uh, limnology and I did a little perform, you know, I did a performance and I, and I spoke about it and a scientist came up to me afterwards, was really upset. And it's like, oh, you're making this music out of this data. Like people are, 
But we do that all the time. We do that with visualization. You, you have numbers, you, you know, you make a green bar, a red bar, and a blue bar, you make them so they're different. That That's not in the data. You you chose that. So it's always there. I think it just is so, so, so much a part of a different environment when it's visual. We're just super used to it. That then when it comes to the sound, that's where, you know, you still get to make these same kind of decisions. But the the consistency and the and the regularity of what a, a piece of data does within that system was was really important to that overall structure. Second part of my question kind of maybe is more directed at Gloria and Ashley and Colin um, thinking about, I think with your project, especially I saw as a sort of like vast amount of data and the, but the, you're also making subjective choices about um, how, especially I think storytelling with it and, and using that in the classroom. And, um, and so I don't know if this is a specific question, but uh, I think in, you know, my own teaching experience, I've had this um, experience of teaching students how to create metadata and the subjectivity that goes into that and um, that being reflected in the types of visualizations, how how the visualizations are appearing on the websites that we build. And so um, I think maybe if you could speak to some of your uh, um, findings and how, how you can, how you teach students about storytelling in this way or how you decide, make those decisions for how things are appearing and communicated through your site. Thus far, because the research is so new, we haven't really, you know, done this. Um, but for me, it's a it's a pedagogy of practice and kind of my research orientation. Um, so, as a scholar of African American history, particularly Midwestern Black history, we really only see African Americans show up in the story when they align with kind of the standard narratives. You know, as I as I tease my students, we see black folk in slavery, we see them in the civil rights movement, we see when Obama's elected, and that's it. Um, and what happens in these interstitial spaces? What does it mean? How do we change the story and the narratives when we think about what black aims is like in 1920? What do we think about that there's a guy named Victor Cools who is writing his dissertation at the University of Iowa in 1917, right? A black man. How, how do we begin to insert those stories to not just have a value added component to a story, but in a way that causes us to shift to think about what we're actually doing? And for me, that's been a really rich experience because by positioning Black people as not just subjects of inquiry, but agents of knowledge, we begin to understand these places. So Victor Cools, it's a dissertation from 1917. So I'm not going to dunk on him because who knows what people think about my dissertation even 10 years later, I shudder to think. Um, because we're at that point and that's also some deep unpacking I need to do. Um, but like he has the first chapter, it is on Des Moines. It is so rich. It's 80 pages long. It's fabulous. Has all this tea and gossip about who's who and a lot on venereal disease. I don't know, but a lot. Um, and then he moves to Cedar Rapids, strong, 30 pages. And then he moves to Iowa City and he has 10 pages. So like, I think if I was advising him, it's like, can we balance out the research, right? But the fact that students now understand that there was somebody studying Black Iowa a hundred years ago challenges that and tells more compelling stories of what this place means and going beyond the tropes of this. So for me, when I think about what this visualization might look like, and this is why I had them go to uh, the Iowa Women's Archive with a specific agenda, Janet Weaver, who's a fabulous archivist there. I said, I want black joy, right? I want, I want how black people see themselves in their daily life. And that switches it, right? Because it changes the narrative. And I want to make sure this is very clear. Racial restrictions are horrible. Racism is horrible. However, it is not consuming black life, right? As we see here, people are building rich, full lives in the confines of these tr traditions. And so this switches black people from being protect or from being props 
in this kind of Midwestern triumphalist narrative to being protagonists of their own stories, right? As opposed to being used as this tool to tell a story of there used to be racism, but now we're awesome. It's really capturing what it means and how they are seeing themselves and not just reacting to a region, but building. Black people are building this region. So for me, that's part of how we do that. And I can, you know, pick the, the literal how we do that on a website down the road for at least a semester. <laughs> I, I completely agree with with everything that you've said, Ashley, I, I appreciate that. And I think that one of the beauties of the Tracing Race Initiative is that it is designed to center the Black experience or the experience of non-white people at Iowa State. And so when we looked at those restrictive deed covenants, I thought, well, this would be fascinating. I'm a historic preservationist. I want to know about the development patterns in Ames. But guess what? The people who had those covenants are white. So that's not part of the story for tracing race. And so trying to foreground those stories, it, it's great to hear the family story about the generations of daughters who were named after the white choral instructor here at Iowa State. I got that family story and I thought, this is wonderful. And then I thought, oh, that is focusing on that white woman who the family appreciated. And it's really not her story. It's about the generations that came from that Iowa State alumnus. And so just having to rethink the focus, those are really interesting stories and maybe they become parts of the sidelights, but they are not the focus. And so nuts and bolts, when, when we first had the story map project, one of the challenges was trying to show the connections among the community. And story maps does not allow you to link very effectively between pages. Kevin could probably confirm that for me. Um, you, we wanted to have individuals associated with houses, associated with other individuals, and provide links among all of those different pages. And the best we could do was have a link from a student's bio to the house location on the map. And that was it. We couldn't do that complex linking that we wanted to see. And I don't think that we've we've really gone back to that to to try to create those. Now we're writing into the narratives who the people might be connected to. And at some point, um, when it's not mostly me, doing the project with my um, various student assistants. Um, I'm, I'm a term faculty member. I teach seven classes a year. I'm not getting paid to do this. This is a labor of love, but that means I don't get to have everything done immediately. And so on my mental list is how do I create those links among the community members to reflect what we are seeing in the data? which is where those students are living, what kinds of activities they're engaging in that connect them to other people, how they're connecting to others in the community. And so best of all possible worlds, at some point we'll have all those connections. And in the meantime, we try to reflect them in the text. And I don't know whether there are any other good ways to do that, but the data, that we have collected. Every time I worked with students, I would have to explain to them what data we were really interested in and how we were categorizing that. So we had to work out the, um, the terms that we would use. We have tags within WordPress that we're using to identify um, the various majors, the degrees that people have received, whether students are military, affiliated or not. And we had to determine what those words were going to be to reflect the data that we were finding. And so we have our terms lists and 
we try to talk to each other about how we apply them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, we have to go back in. We've reached the end of the formal question and answer period, but I hope there'll be many people who stick around for the reception to continue these conversations. I'm going to hand the microphone, I think you've already got one over there, to Olivia now. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Matt. Thanks for um, being the moderator for this panel. And thank you all to our um, panelists, both this afternoon and this morning. And thank you to the audience for for coming. You know, we didn't quite know what we'd get trying this for the first time, but um, I think we're all very excited about the response. I'm excited to continue our conversation over at the reception um, coming up. So um, I wanted to thank a few people that without um, Without them, this would not have been a reality at all. Um, so thanks especially to our Center for Excellence in Arts and Humanities, Matt Sibbles and Noemi T T Tihani. Tihani. Um, and uh, also with a great team from the library, um, Michael Cummings, Aaron Ridner from our Digital Scholarship and Initiatives um, Department, uh, Susan Gent and Monica Gillen from our fabulous communications team, uh, Landon Mule from uh, Tech Support um, with Library IT. Um, so if we can just give those folks a round of applause. Um, and I think there's nothing more to say except uh, join us across the hall at the Catalyst for hors d'oeuvres and refreshments. Um, if you, uh, so that will last uh, from four until 5.30. Uh, Dean Hillary Sayo is gonna come in at about 4.30 and just say a few words. So please stick around um, for that and um, just take the chance to kind of sit and mingle and um, ask questions, learn from each other. Um, and again, thank you all. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing you over there.